three dwarfs in the wood should clear up any confusion between fairy gifts and fairy transactions. If you would like to learn about fairy folklore, delve into modern fairy faith spirituality, and explore fun and fanciful fairy-themed events, please subscribe to Fairy Fortunes for new videos every Friday. Hello, my fair friends. I'm Ruby Ruse, and on today's episode of Fairy Fortunes, I'd like to talk about the difference between fairy gifts and fairy transactions. Now, I've seen a lot of misinformation floating around the modern internet regarding fairy gifts and how bad these things are supposed to be. I just can't find any evidence of what people are talking about in fairy tales or other types of folklore. And I think what really might be going on is that there is a misunderstanding between a fairy gift versus a fairy transaction, which is a completely different thing. So let me offer my definition of what a gift is. A gift is something that is willingly given without any expectation, payment, or any other kind of transaction. Now, when people think of gifts, their minds immediately go to a tangible present. And that is the first category of gift, but there are two other types of gifts, which are intangible. The second form of gift that is intangible is an invitation. So if you invite someone to share something with you, if you invite someone to go somewhere with you, this invitation is a type of gift because there's no expectation there, or rather there shouldn't be an expectation there. Meaning the person receiving that invitation is free to decline. And the third type of gift, which is also intangible, is an endowment. An endowment is something that is bequeathed or is a concept that is given. So for example, a very common fairy gift endowment is the gift of beauty. In a human context, an endowment might be that a mentor is willingly giving their expertise and their knowledge to someone who is younger or subordinate to them without any expectation, payment, or any other type of transaction. Now, a mentor, just to be clear, is not a teacher. A teacher is someone who is paid to teach, to give knowledge, but someone who is a mentor just willingly offers that. Now, in contrast, a transaction is any time there is some form of expectation or any type of exchange. There's a scenario of this for that. Now, I think there are four types of transactions. The first is simply having some type of expectation. The second type of transaction is, of course, payment. The third type is a request because a request is made with expectations. I request this, you will give me that. And then the fourth type of transaction is an expression of gratitude because an expression of gratitude is a form of payment. So I thought the best way to articulate these fairy gifts versus fairy transactions would be to share with you one of my favorite fairy stories, The Three Dwarves in the Wood. Once upon a time, a young wife of a rich merchant died suddenly, and her heartbroken husband tried to care for their only daughter by himself. After several years, he met a young widow who also was trying to take care of herself and her only daughter, and considering himself fortunate, married her immediately. His new wife pretended to be sweet and gentle, so the poor man did not realize that she was hard-hearted and jealous of his beautiful daughter. He died soon after their wedding. The poor girl was then left alone with her evil stepmother and ugly stepsister. One day in the middle of winter, 
The cruel woman put a basket in her stepdaughter's hand. Go and gather strawberries and don't come back until this basket is full, she said, hoping the girl would perish in the snow. After she had given the child a paper dress to wear and a crust of dry bread to eat, the wicked woman sent her out into the howling storm. Ungrateful wretch, I give you clothes to wear and food to eat and I don't even get to wear the pinks. Now here's where I want to point out the first transaction in the story. Now remember that the clothes here are actually a paper dress and the food to eat is a crust of dry bread. The stepmother requires though a word of thanks which is payment for that paper dress and the crust of bread. So that clearly indicates that it is a transaction. And what's interesting here is that the stepmother also has a very covert expectation here. She purposely gave the girl the paper dress and the meager food in order to cause the death of the young girl. This for that. The paper dress will then kill her. The shivering girl walked barefoot through the snow and after a time came upon a tiny cottage where three dwarves greeted her and invited her in. Now here we have an invitation. This is the very first gift in the story. The girl is actually free to decline this offer. The dwarves at this point have no expectations at all. They just see a young girl in need and offer to have her come in and get warm by their fire. They led her to a warm place by the fire, and when she began to eat her dry bread, they begged her to share it with them. Gladly, she said, and then divided the little crust. Now, when they ask her to share her bread with them, that is something entirely different because there's an expectation there. They are expecting her to share that bread with them. So an invitation is a completely free gift, whereas a request is a transaction. Now, I can appreciate where the confusion between gifts and transactions comes, because particularly in the case of requests, a request is generally returned with a gift. So the girl returning the dwarf's request of food is an example of a returned gift. She willingly shares her bread with the dwarves. She does not ask for anything in return. There are absolutely no expectations there at all, and that would denote a gift, not a transaction. Now, one more thing that I want to point out about this particular moment in the story is that you'll notice that the dwarves do not offer any kind of expression of gratitude when the girl shares the bread with them. And I think this is actually evidence that supports that fairies think being thanked is an abhorrent thing. And I think the reason for this might be that to them, to offer that expression of gratitude turns what should have been a gift into a transaction. And so I think this actually might be that in fairy culture, when you receive a gift, you do not offer an expression of gratitude in return. Because instead of accepting the gift, you are then turning it into a transaction. As they ate together, she told them about her evil stepmother. The dwarves were outraged that so gentle a child should be so cruelly treated, and they decided to help her. But before they did, they needed to test her more. Please, child, would you sweep the snow off our steps, they asked. I would gladly do anything to repay your kindness. Now the next transaction is when the dwarves make another request of the girl. They ask her to sweep the steps. And I think this is a very important moment in the story because this demonstrates that not all requests are met with a gift in return. In this instance, when the dwarves make the request of sweeping the steps, 
the girl responds with, I would gladly do anything to repay your kindness. And there she's even using that word repay. Her gratitude is the payment for their kindness. So their kindness is no longer a gift, it's a transaction. And this is important because it means that transactions aren't innately a bad thing. They're just not a gift. She took a broom and walked barefoot out into the snow. The dwarves looked at each other and nodded in satisfaction. Good deeds should be re richly rewarded, they agreed. So they immediately gave the girl three magic gifts. The dwarves promised that every day she would grow more beautiful, that gold coins would drop from her mouth whenever she spoke, and that a handsome king would marry her. Meanwhile, as the girl was sweeping the steps, she suddenly gasped in astonishment, for beneath the snow, she found the biggest strawberries she had ever seen. She filled her basket to overflowing, and then after a hasty farewell to the dwarves, ran home. <laughs> now here is the moment where we actually get to a magical fairy gift. <laughs> there are two endowments and two tangible gifts. So the first endowment is, of course, that very traditional, very common fairy gift that she will grow more beautiful with every passing day. So that's, we see that in other stories beyond three dwarves in the woods. That's a very common motif that we see in fairy tale stories and in folklore. The second gift is more tangible, and that is that gold coins will drop from her mouth when she speaks. So that's a very tangible present that they give her. The next gift is another endowment. Um, I would even say that it's more divination than it is an endowment, but we'll go with it. It's an endowment is that a king will marry her. And then they say that they give her three gifts, but actually they give her four because they give her another tangible gift. They do actually give her the strawberries because it is the magic of the dwarves that causes those strawberries to grow and appear in the snow. So she actually gets four gifts and not three in this instance. So let's talk about those gifts for a little bit. <laughs> like, I don't know, I'm not seeing too many consequences going on with that. Well, maybe a little because, I mean, it might get a little bit annoying that every time she talks, like gold coins are just littering the floor in front of her. Please. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe that's a little bit annoying. Like she probably has to have a personal page that follows her around and like sweeps up all the gold coins, you know, as she walks. I don't know. You know, the other thing is maybe she doesn't talk as much because, you know, every time she opens her mouth, gold coins fall out. I don't, I don't know, you know, you know, I'm, so maybe there are consequences to that. Maybe. I. I'm, I'm gonna say, though, no. Her stepmother roughly grabbed the basket from her hands when she returned. Where did you get strawberries in midwinter? Stole them from some rich man, I'm sure. The girl started to explain, but as she spoke, a shiny gold coin dropped from her mouth, and then another, and still another, and by the time she had finished telling the story of the three dwarves, the floor was covered with gold, and her stepmother became more jealous than ever. The woman desired the same good fortune for her own ugly daughter, so she decided that she too must visit the three dwarves in the wood. But before she sent the dreary girl out in the snow, she gave her a warm coat of heavy white fur to wear and a large basket of goodies to eat. When the churlish girl arrived at the dwarves' cottage, she walked right in without an invitation, sat down by the fire, and opened her basket of goodies. Don't you dare touch a crumb! I'm hungry, and I'm only enough for myself. The dwarves were offended by her rudeness, but decided to give her another chance. Would you be so kind enough to sweep our steps for us? The first one asked politely. Sweep them yourself! I'm not 
not your servant, she snapped, and then went to look for strawberries in the snow. It's at this moment, with her expecting those gifts, that we know that she's not going to get them, because if she has expectations, it is not a gift, it's a transaction. And more than that, her expectations really get in the way. She doesn't even allow for the gift of an invitation. She just barges right into the dwarf's cottage because her expectations are on the forefront of her mind. She has completely gone into transaction mode and she has not even allowed the dwarves to offer her the very simplistic gift of an invitation. With the girl, we saw that transactions aren't innately bad, that transactions are a perfectly healthy and fine way to nurture relationships. But once again, we see here that the ugly stepsister doesn't even give the dwarves an opportunity to initiate even a transaction with her. Before they can even make a request, she tells them, Don't you dare touch a crumb! I'm hungry, and I'm only enough for myself. So f then when the dwarves are finally allowed the opportunity to initiate a transaction with her, because that is clearly what she wants in this situation, she completely rejects them. Unkind deeds must be rewarded too, the dwarves said to each other as she left. I promise that she will grow uglier every day, said the first dwarf. And I promise every time she speaks, toads will jump from her mouth, said the second. And I promise that she will die a miserable death, said the third. Now, in the case of the ugly stepsister, she does not receive gifts. She receives punishments. And I really think that punishments are just going to have to be a completely different video. I do think that punishments are, are related to gifts, but definitely punishments are not gifts. I think because there's some expectations that go with punishments. So stay tuned. <laughs> I'll circle back to that at a later date. Outside in the snow, the rude girl was in a terrible temper because she could find no strawberries. Finally, she gave up and ran home. She began complaining the moment she entered the house, but everyone jumped back in horror when an ugly speckled toad jumped from her mouth, and then another, and still another, until the floor was covered in the slimy creatures. Shut your mouth and go to your room, screamed the mother frantically, or you'll fill the whole house with these hateful creatures. So now we've really seen all that we're going to see of the of the three dwarves in the woods. Of course, the story goes on and the lessons of gifts versus transactions also continues in the story. From that day on, the evil woman was more enraged than ever. Jealously, she noticed that her stepdaughter grew more beautiful every day and richer too. It's all your fault, she screamed at the girl one day. You with your false stories of dwarves and strawberries in the snow. Take this blanket and wash it in the river and don't come back until it's clean. The beautiful girl asked for forgiveness and begged for pity. The river is frozen solid, she cried. Then take a hammer and break the ice, shouted the stepmother. But the blanket is badly stained. I'll surely freeze to death before it's clean, sobbed the girl. Then you'll freeze, and good riddance to you, said the terrible woman. Once again, the unfortunate girl went out in the cold winter and walked shivering to the riverbank. But as she was trying to break the thick ice, the royal coach happened to pass. The young king riding inside saw the beautiful girl struggling with the heavy hammer. He ordered his coachman to halt. Then he jumped down and ran swiftly to the frozen river and gently took the hammer from the poor girl's icy hands. I am here to help you, he said, looking down as she knelt before him. Alas, no one can help me, she cried desperately. Their eyes met, and in an instant they were in love. Will you ride with me to my castle? asked the king. Willingly, whispered the girl. And will you be my queen? he added. Gladly, gratefully, she sighed. Here we have an interaction between two humans, but we do have a transaction occurring. The king 
asks the girl to ride with him to the castle. It's a request. And here the girl responds once again with a gift. She willingly agrees to ride to the castle with the king. And incidentally, all the girl is giving, all she is consenting to, if you will, is just her presence and her company. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> like, that is the nature of the gift there. So then we have an additional request the king proposes marriage. That's, that's, once again, a transaction. There are expectations there. He is expecting, at the very minimum, an answer. There are expectations there, so it is a transaction and not a gift. I personally think it's very interesting that the girl responds to the marriage proposal not with a gift, but with a transaction. She expresses gratitude for the marriage, which is a form of payment. So that to me says that at least from the girl's perspective in the story, marriage is a transaction and it is not a gift. The very next day they were married in great splendor. Within a year, a beautiful son was born to them and their happiness was complete. The cruel stepmother and the ugly stepdaughter, still full of envy, came to the royal bedchamber pretending to admire the baby and beg the queen's forgiveness. The gentle queen willingly forgave them, but when the king left her side for a minute, the evil woman seized her and threw her out the window into the lake below, where she was magically transformed into a beautiful white duck with a tiny golden crown on her head. Swiftly, the woman pushed her ugly daughter into the royal bed and drew the curtains around her. When the king returned, the stepmother told him his wife was sleeping and must not be disturbed. The next day, a young page noticed the crowned duck swimming in the lake of the castle. As he reached down to pet it, he was amazed to hear it speak. I am your queen, Master Page, and I command you to take me to my baby. The page dared not refuse and carried the duck to the threshold of the royal nursery, where it was transformed instantly into the lovely queen. She ran to her baby's side, tucked him into his cradle gently, and kissed him tenderly. Then, with a deep sigh, she left the room and returned to the lake once more in the form of a duck. Twice more she ordered the page to take her to the nursery, but on the third day she had a different request. Go to his majesty, she said, and beg him to come here and swing his sword over my head in three wide circles. The king came directly to the lake and swung his sword in three wide circles over the duck's head just as commanded. As he finished the third circle, the duck vanished, and in its place stood the beautiful queen. When the king learned of the story of the evil stepmother's treachery, he vowed that she and her ugly daughter should be justly punished. Tell me a suitable punishment for evildoers who have tried to drown an innocent person, he demanded when he found the wicked women. They should be shut up in a barrel full of spikes and rolled into the water to drown, they answered. You have just pronounced your own fate, said his majesty. The king ordered this punishment to be carried out at once. Ever after, he and his queen could live in peace and happiness, just as the three dwarves in the wood had promised the gentle maiden. I mentioned that fairy punishments would have to be a whole other video and I just want to put out there that I have a lot more to say about fairy gifts and fairy transactions. So if you would be so kind, I see I'm making a request here. <laughs> If you would be so kind. I would really appreciate it that if you do have questions about gifts or transactions or punishments or something along those lines, if you would please help me out and leave some comments and questions down below, that would be helpful because then I can use those in order to kind of direct where this series could possibly go. And if you like this video, I think that you would also really enjoy Should You Give a Fairy Your Name? What Rumpelstiltskin teaches us about the power of names. And I've also featured the story, The Three Dwarves in the Wood, in another video 
Fairy morality is not about good and evil, seven fairy values. And so I think you would also enjoy that video as well. And with that, have a magical day.